Good afternoon to everybody. And uh, let me also say that uh, we are very happy to be part of this network. And we had so far a very interesting start. As Clement said, we were actually able to produce some cross-country uh, papers. And uh, as you can see, this panel was also supposed to have been cross-country, but somehow we lost our left wing here. Um, maybe due to some uh, uh, longer than expected coalition talks in Germany or something else which we, which we don't know yet. Is the right wing C from there? Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's uh, what it's going to say. <laughs> that uh, there might be differences of views <laughs> depending on which side of uh, the room you are sitting. Now, the topic today is the, the future of EMU, and that is, of course, you can't make it more general than that. But I think uh, people in the room uh, know what we are talking about. They know the, the circumstances, uh, the issues at stake. And uh, therefore, we'd like to make this as much interactive as possible. And the idea was that uh, everybody gets uh, between five and seven minutes to make an introductory statement. But let me perhaps abuse my position here to change that a little bit. <laughs> and I would like to ask uh, all three colleagues here one question which they hopefully answer in one minute or less. And the question is uh, the following. If everything that you advocate were to be implemented, would the European economy be materially different in two years? And would it be materially different in 10 years? Right? And maybe I start with uh, Massimo to my right. Just one minute. One minute. First of all, let me thank everybody for, um, for thanks uh, for inviting me and uh, everybody for being here. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think yes, but what I'm going to propose, uh, I mean, as I'm going to say, is that perhaps we should, uh, for the moment, stop a moment with the euro area, think to other things, because I think that's uh, what would be important to do at the moment, and that I think that is going to would probably change a lot uh, how the economy or the, the, <coughs> the European economy is going to work in. Uh, a few years. So would it would be much better? It would be materially better off. Well, I, I mean, at least uh, we we, tr we will try to solve some of the problems that we still have. I mean, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that uh, perhaps one uh, the point which we will insist more is to go on some kind of uh, fundamental uh, European public goods which we are not uh, providing at a good level, and so I think uh, this would be improved. I'm thinking of uh, things like uh, defense, security. You will have your idea. okay. Uh, okay, no, um, as part of the one minute, because the answer is yes. I mean, uh, this is, you cannot ask a policymaker to okay, say, that's uh, true, that's true. you say, look, uh, in two years, uh, I mean, six months already, uh, <coughs> it would be better. Um, so, no, yes, definitely. Um, I think what is um, on the we, what is on the table, what we are going to put on the table, I think, is going to, uh, if implemented uh, properly, is going to strengthen. Uh, I think resilience of the economy, so in terms of uh, capacity to withstand the next crisis, whenever that will come, uh, I think we'll be in a better position to have that, uh, in, and we would avoid, uh, let's say, the existential uh, trauma that we had uh, back, uh, you know, 2011, uh, 12, 12, uh, 2012, uh, 2013. And also, since we put a lot of emphasis also on the medium to long term, I mean, we tend to uh, we like to think that we have, as an institution, a lower discount rate than uh, the than the governments. We will be in a better position in terms of long, longer term uh, prospects. To okay. So both the average growth performance should improve, and the resilience to shocks. I would think so. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, I. I'm, it's not. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, to answer the question, the answer is also yes for me. I think if we put in place our proposition, it will improve the situation in the European Union and in the Eurozone in the two years and in ten years. And the two main issues are better deal with crisis, and that's the point of Marco, and it's exactly the same. And the second one is reconvergence in the Euro area, uh, the fact that we should have closer standard of living 
in the coming years and not the situation we had uh, since uh, the creation of the, of the euro. Okay, as a panel is now complete, and just to inform Thomas that I changed a bit the usual setup. Uh, everybody will have five to seven minutes soon. Uh, but uh, I had first asked everybody to answer a simple question, which is the following. Uh, assume everything you propose will be implemented fully. Would that have a material impact on the European economy in the short run, let's say in two years, and in the long run, let's say 10 years? What do you want to have implemented? No. What, you what you proposing? What I propose. <laughs> propose anything yet uh, <coughs> or what you think would be the ideal yeah okay thank you thank you very much uh, sorry for being late uh, this uh, changing in the timing had not reached me but uh, that may be a problem in my on my side so I actually wanted to pro to propose a number of things and um, maybe I have the time later on to do that exactly. okay um, and I think um, that uh, first of all we need to um, find a way to to propose credible things, and that is exactly in the direction of your question. I think we, we need to, whatever we propose now, we need to think about how to implement it and um, how to improve what we have uh, today in the sense uh, of, uh, of successful implementation. I mean, I think that that's the, that's the borderline. I think we should really stop in Europe to propose big things and to not deliver. I think we have seen far too much of that and I mean you know everybody has some examples for that. We have announced to become the most competitive region in the world. We have never reached that target. We thought that un youth unemployment was too high so we decided the youth guarantee uh, promising to every unemployed young man or woman to have an offer in the next six months. We have never done much of a thing to, to achieve that. So I think actually, actually, actually implementation is, is the name of the game today. Okay. Now, so you can imagine why I asked the question. <laughs> um, when you have your five to seven minutes, if you could please then also think how materially the things that you are proposing or that you think would be ideal would actually translate into more resilience and higher average growth. Massimo, we start with you again. Okay, uh, thank you very much again for the invitation. Uh, let me say that I'm very much uh, sympathetic with the presentation of, uh, the, of the new group, uh, Econ, uh, what is the name? Uh, Econ Pol Europe. I think it is uh, very important to try to make this kind of a bridge across countries because one of the big problems that we have in Europe is actually that the media market, but also in a sense research market, are completely separate. So I have exactly the same, uh, uh, the same uh, 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 feeling that uh, uh, Clements has that when you uh, when you you know travel to Berlin, people speak and you seem to have gone in, a, in another outer world. If you go to France or if you go to Italy, you have uh, different views. So I really think that uh, uh, all this kind of initiative should be supported. I'm very glad to participate. Okay, uh, le, le, the humor area. I mean, the, the, the way in which I interpreted the, the title, uh, because clearly it was a very vague title, title was something to say, what, how will you do, what will you do to fix the euro area? What should you do? I mean, my feeling is, I might be wrong, but this is a, a moment in which we are here to discuss, um, probably to fix the euro area will probably not begin with the euro area. I mean, I think that, uh, I think that uh, of course, uh, this is risky because another financial crisis can come tomorrow and then we are still not ready to resist to such a, to such a, a crisis. But it's also true that at the moment uh, the legacy of high debt, uh, the scars of uh, the recession are still so high that I'm afraid that uh, we are not able to do, to spend a lot of copy, uh, capital, uh, political capital to try to make steps and maybe these steps are not convincing or we might end up in a situation that we have seen many times in Europe, which uh, we find an agreement on something, but then everybody interprets the agreement in a different way. This is a, a typical characteristic. Where, where, where we should, I, I think instead that we should go, I think we should have a very ambitious agenda on some of the things we have been discussing for a long time, like things like defense, border control, security, immigration, environment, digital economy, infrastructure, and so on. These are more or less the content of the recent Macron speech in Sorbonne. 
I think that uh, we should go in that direction because I think there is much more consensus on what European citizen on the need to centralize this function. There are strong national and international reasons which push in this direction. And probably to that, I would also add that since it, and this is another thing we have been discussing for 20 years, and maybe now Brexit gives us an opportunity about harmonizing capital corporate taxation. I mean, we, we do have a number of problems. You were asking before, Daniel, why you think that your proposal are going to do, to do better for the economy. I mean, we do have a problem in Europe, which is a problem of tax competition, tax evasion, and uh, you know, there are some countries in Europe which uh, it's hard not to uh, consider them like something like tax even. So I think we have to make some step forward in this direction. I think that this is a collective thing that we have to do. Of course, uh, making progress in this field is not at all easy. Despite Brexit, there will be going to be strong resistance uh, across between uh, groups uh, and uh, organized groups also. Now we also have a problem with the populistic nationalistic movement which are on the rise in any European country, but this is the best way which we can answer to this, to this question, We're showing that Europe can deliver. Of course, this will not fix the euro area, but hopefully we we'll start to create a better climate which might make, allow us to make some step forward in the future. And also, if we don't manage to make some step forward on these things, I don't, where, where there is a clear uh, economic rationale to go on, because these are things which we definitely can do better <coughs> together that alone, I don't really see how we can make much uh, step uh, forward in the uh, EMU area. What about the, uh, the EMU area? Which is the problem with the EMU area? I think that uh, EMU area, I think that, uh, I mean, at least economists would agree which are the problem. I mean, it's still a, an incomplete monetary union, so it's a potentially fragile construction, and uh, since it's a potentially fragile construction, it might perform suboptimally. Which are the three problems, as I see, but I think that a lot of uh, economists would agree with that. Uh, there is no central budget, not sufficient of, uh, central budget. We do have the European budget, but it's only 1% of GDP and it's not there to play stabilization role. So we don't have a macroeconomic stabilization mechanism which can take care of asymmetric or asymmetric shock. We have some loose form of cooperation across country which are supported by the, the Commission, but they work very little. There is no country which, uh, when deciding its fiscal policy, taking account the effect on its fiscal policy on other country. And as we know, if there are spillover effect, this lead to suboptimal national equilibrium. And, uh, and even the rule is such that if we want, we can force some country to spend less, maybe, but we cannot force another country to spend more if it doesn't want to do, even if uh, a lot of people would agree that it should. And maybe we would not want to do it anyhow because national preference has to be respected. So what we will need, we will need a federal budget which can make a federal, uh, we could decide how to spend this money, but we have neither a federal budget nor we have a federal law. So that's the one problem. In terms of the fact, since we do not have a federal fiscal policy, two minutes. Okay, so let me click. We also run the risk of overburdening monetary policy, particularly in situation zero interest rate. And of course, we have seen it happening now. The monetary policy has been the only federal institution which has tried to support demand. But uh, pushing only or relying only on monetary policy might have a number of unpleasant consequences. And like, for example, the possibility of creating bubble for the future in zero interest rate. And, so, and uh, there are very limited insurance mechanisms that allow to smooth uh, asymmetric shock across country. We do have some work in mobility, but it's much, much more limited for the reason that we know. There is little integration on capital market, and that uh, the can banking union is still incomplete. And of course, uh, if we have to find some way to, uh, say, to increase uh, insurance, uh, risk insurance, we also have to find more risk reduction. So I think this is the way. Uh, we have ma made some step forward in the past uh, introducing enhanced fiscal surveillance of the country, common supervision of the main bank, the ESM, but they are still incomplete. So that's the point uh, and where there are a number of proposals on the ground, but maybe the reason why I'm a bit critical of this proposal, I, mean, I'm, I, will, do, I will say something more in the next, uh, when you allow me to speak again. Thank you. <laughs> I allow you immediately <laughs> to answer me one further question. Um, you talked about tax uh, harmonization is one issue, corporate tax harmonization, plus, let's say, demand management in the broadest sense, monetary and fiscal policy. Would you expect from these instruments or measures that you have in mind a level effect 
on GDP or permanently higher growth? Well, that's a very difficult thing. I mean, I think Sorry, it's a difficult thing. I think that clearly, if you can improve something in terms of tax coordination, tax, tax organization, you certainly introduce less distortion in the allocation of capital, this should increase, you the, uh, the, uh, the increase the longer run growth of the economy. So I'm expecting this will have even some positive effect in terms of the uh, longer run growth. <coughs> in terms of macroeconomic, uh, in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of uh, macroeconomic management, that is more a stabilization issue. I, do, I mean, from that point of view, I'm more on the supply side. I mean, I think that uh, what we will need to do is to have uh, to make the economy work better. I mean, but if you have a crisis, then you have to make, find way even to address this crisis because otherwise the risk is that, uh, you know, you might have uh, effect on the supply side as well because you have uh, uh, effect which go, go, which remain. Okay, thanks. I think some of these themes will be taken up by Marco, and you can already imagine what I'm going to ask you in case you don't address it yourself. <coughs> Okay, um, no, thank you very much. First of all, uh, let me thank uh, Clemens uh, for, for his introduction. I, I mean, the point of uh, not having sufficient dialogues, uh, um, you know, across frontiers, uh, I think is, um, is not only, um, you know, an academic issue, it's actually um, uh, very important also because it has material consequences. And uh, I think what uh, we found uh, uh, during the crisis was that uh, I mean, the different narratives uh, in different countries uh, on the, the origin of the crisis, its persistence, uh, uh, etc., had you know led to a heated uh, debate and very controversial debate, which actually um, hampered the, the, um, the, the finding of a common of a common solution and led to a lot of hesitation, procrastination, etc. So, especially in times of um, uh, duress. Uh, I think different interpretations actually can have uh, material consequences. So it's important uh, this uh, not only for uh, you know broader academic understanding, but also for formulation of uh, uh, policies uh, which are which are effective. Now on uh, the um, on the issue. Okay, first of all, I show you the book uh, we have just published uh, today. Our autumn forecast uh, just presented by the commissioner a couple of hours ago, um, and what we find here is. Uh, is that we are entering into good times. Uh, we are not saying uh, in the forecast that uh, we are fully in good times uh, already, but certainly in a better position uh, than, uh, um, than we were only, let's say, a year uh, or even six months, uh, six months ago. Uh, growth is uh, robust, is also, also very broad-based. Uh, so for the first <coughs> time, not only we have positive uh, positive growth in uh, all part of the uh, of the EU, but the growth is there is a reconvergence after a period of divergence during the crisis. So I think this is um, overall good news. There is a downside uh, of, of this, uh, and it is usually that um, um, the worst uh, mistakes are usually done in good times. Uh, so this is something that we have to be very watchful uh, uh, about. And uh, so uh, and typically uh, the experience that we have had in the past uh, 10 years, 10 years since the beginning of the crisis, but probably also before, is that the, um, we have operated under what I have called uh, in, in many, many occasions, uh, we have operated under the ultima ratio uh, paradigm. Uh, so only when we were shoulder against the wall, uh, we found the courage uh, to bounce back and make, uh, make uh, courageous uh, decisions. And this applies both at the national level, it applies at the EU Euro area level. Um, so I think the, what we need to do now really is to fight back against the temp temptation of complacency, uh, uh, sit, sit down and wait, wait for, uh, because the economy is doing, uh, is doing better. What we have in our forecast is, uh, yes, in the the outlook in the short term is uh, positive, but we have a problem of potential growth, which is a massive uh, one. So uh, one of the tasks that we are going to have to face uh, now is to push through uh, the structural reforms, which actually boost the growth potential uh, looking, uh, looking forward. We can do something at the euro area and the European level on this. I think we have uh, some of the issues uh, mentioned by Massimo before are 
uh, clearly a top of the agenda, but a lot of the, of the work, let's face it, has to be done at the national level. So really you should have two forecasts, one current policies, and one if everything is implemented, what you're proposing, everything plus 1%. Uh, look, um, the, what we do for, uh, in our forecast has a, uh, has a specific uh, role in the economic okay. surveillance that we have. So we are very rigorous actually on uh, the no policy change. That's why, in a sense, go, go back to what Thomas said, indicated at the very beginning. Uh, when we go, go to, and uh, we have added now 2019, which is an unchanged policies, it shows also when there is uh, uh, you know, a gap in, on the fiscal side, how much one is expect the government to do, to, to do in order to bridge, uh, to bridge the gap. So this is the, um, this is the, the, the situation. Now, looking forward in terms of uh, priorities, um, I think, uh, is it the time to lower the ambition? I don't think so. Uh, I think we have to be very ambitious uh, uh, indeed. Um, I think we have a, a window of opportunities economically. I think against the odds uh, in the debate up politically, we also have a window of opportunity now to make uh, a step forward. Obviously, we are not you know, naive, uh, so we know that uh, there will be obstacles and they will ha one has to do things uh, in a measured uh, way. But I think in trying to outline what to do, one has to, uh, to take a bit, let's say, three criteria. Okay, the first one, we have to put forward proposals which are economically rational. So this is, uh, I think, is important. I think what we what we we'll need to do is to try to sketch out what is the final equilibrium. I'm talking here in particular for the euro area, but can also for the EU, uh, for the EU as a whole. So, so to anchor the choices that we make in the in the uh, in the short uh, in the short term, and on this for the final stage of EMU, what we have called the banking union, I think the fiscal union, and the economic union. I think that one can discuss what the content is of, of this, I think, are all uh, important. The second thing is um, the choices have to be financially robust. This means that um, we have to proceed on the risk sharing and uh, risk reduction, being very careful that certain elements of uh, uh, risk reduction, if not with the proper sequencing, the risk to turn out uh, to be to lead to financial instability. For example, for example, for, no, for, no, for example, I think, uh, and I, I go straight to the point because I know what you have in mind. I tell you what I think. Uh, when uh, you have proposals uh, that, in case of liquidity assistance, imply or request an automatic restructuring of the debt, this is risk increasing. It's not risk redu uh, reducing. So this is, I'll give you an example which is, um, uh, okay, uh, it has been part of the, of the, uh, uh, of the debate. Um, so with the uh, uh, proper approach and the proper uh, sequencing, I think we, we can make it, uh, uh, make it uh, this proposal financially, uh, let's say, robust. And then politically viable, obviously. And here on the political viability, there is an issue of uh, proceeding step by steps. Now what we are looking at, is to have, uh, uh, after the discussion in the Eurogroup, the proposals of the Commission on the 6th of December and the <coughs> Euro Area Summit to have a mandate to make progress for, uh, in view of uh, June 2018. So what we, it is obvious that uh, we cannot achieve uh, everything by June 2018, far from there, um, but we have to make substantive progress. now. On what is the priority, I think, for the short term, let's say the next uh, six to nine months, looking at mid next year, I think the most urgent issue is uh, uh, on the banking union side. So I think there, there has been a discussion there on the, uh, at the Eurogroup level, proposals by the Commission in mid-October. I think we can complete, complete, and we have the chance to complete the second uh, pillar of uh, banking union with the fiscal backstop for the single resolution fund. I think there is rather broad agreement. Jeroen Dijsenblum, president of the Eurogroup, has said it uh, to have the ESM as the, um, as the backstop. And I think we have uh, a chance to make 
the size progress uh, on the uh, on edis so the deposit credit according in, let's see in line with the proposal of the commission of uh, mid october going to a stage uh, a staged uh, um, they say progress on that uh, on that front uh, so this is uh, let's say first priority we can come back to the next uh, uh, yes now on, next on my left i have the let's say people from two countries which are commonly taken to be the decisive uh, decision makers on what is politically viable. If you permit me one minute, please. Um, you were commenting on the forecast that uh, it's a big uh, degree of convergence. I mean, all countries are growing, growing at similar rates. And I take this occasion to make publicity for a paper which we are presenting tomorrow, um, where we look at two different issues. One is the degree of correlation among countries in their business cycles, which can be very high. And then the amplitude, which can be very different. So if the amplitude is very different, then in the middle of the cycle, you have perfect correlation, you have the same growth rates for everybody. But that's misleading because some countries will accelerate a lot and others less. And then when you have peak and the trough of the cycle, then you have divergences again. So maybe, right, this might be an intermediate phase, which is uh, somewhat misleading. I close the parenthesis and I turn to my neighbor here. Thanks, Robert. Yes, thank you. Thank you first for, for inviting me to this, this conference. It's, I think it's, it's very useful to have those, those discussions about uh, the Eurozone, uh, the European Monetary Union, and, and, and more, more specifically because, as it was already said, uh, uh, the, uh, the, di the, di the, the diagnosis of, of the crisis is quite different from one country to another, from one one academics to another, and it's very useful to exchange on that. My, 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 I, I won't talk about the European Union agenda, so, so I will focus really on the Eurozone, so I won't say anything on, on tax harmonization, defense, or many different things that, uh, that are on the table now, or, or in Macron's speech at, at La Sorbonne a few weeks ago. So I will focus on, on the Eurozone. And when we look at the Eurozone, the first thing to say is that many things, many reforms have been implemented in response to the, the economic and finance crisis. So we have done many things, you know, regarding uh, the establishment of the banking union. It was a really big move of the Eurozone and it's, it's a big thing. And uh, the creation of a crisis manage management mechanism, the MES, it's a big, the ESM, it's, a, it's, it's an important step too. But, but however, in my view, the euro area continues to show major shortcomings, hindering its ability to cope with a new crisis. And this, I think this is key, and this is what we have to, to, to discuss about the eurozone. Those shortcomings, the first one is the divergence of living standards between the eurozone country. Not the European Union country, it's different, but really the eurozone country. We have a large divergence of standard of living since 2000 and, 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 the, and especially after the crisis, but even before the crisis. My second point is that in a situation of a new crisis, I think that we can have a symmetric shock in the Eurozone, which could lead to very different situation in the different countries. So to say it, we can have symmetric or asymmetric shock, I think it's not really important. What is important is that with symmetric or asymmetric shock, we will have asymmetric consequences for the different countries. And I think this is key. And in my view, there are three main reasons why. Okay, yes. That's 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 can you give us examples? <laughs> yeah. The first one is macroeconomic imbalances. And the fact that at the beginning of the crisis, the competitiveness levels of the country are different. So that's the first element. The second one is the fact that the capital flows are too volatile in the Eurozone. So as we have seen in the previous crisis, we can have large change of capital flows in a very short period of time. And this, is, this, this could be detrimental to some countries. My third point is about the difficulties for some country to finance stabilization expenditure in a time <coughs> of crisis. To say bluntly, it's about the, the, the level of in sovereign interest rates in a time of crisis. So we have those three channels in time of crisis and we have to organize ourselves in the Eurozone in order to be sure that the next crisis will have less impact 
and we have already we, we already have done some some part of of, of the of the of the of the of the work, but but we, we need to do more, and in order to do more, we have two pillars. The first one is and it, it's the same one as Macro, uh, Marcos uh, said. It's about responsibility of, of countries and solidarity between the different countries in, in, in the Eurozone. So about responsibility, it's make in each country the necessary structural reforms. That's the first point. And the second one is, uh, of course, about soon public finances in all countries. But at the same time, we don't think that it's enough to have this responsibility or, or, or risk reduction, you know, uh, 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 pillar. We ne also need a stronger uh, solidarity pillar in the Eurozone with three main things. And the first one is financial integration. It's, 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 it's about having a complete, a real banking union, you know, banks all over Europe and liquidity and capital going from one country to another in order to, <coughs> to have private risk sharing in the Eurozone. That's the, the, the first point. The second one is about more economic integration to, be, to better coordinate our policies. This is about imbalances, you know, competitiveness issue and things like that. And we think that it's important too. And the last one, it's about fiscal integration. We need, in order to reduce those divergence in the Eurozone, have an investment capacity. And that, that was what President Macron said in his speech in, in, in La Sorbonne. We think it's useful to have this inv investment capacity in order to reduce you know, the difference of productivity or even competitiveness between the different uh, Eurozone countries. And at the same time, with this fiscal capacity, we need a stabilization function in order to absorb shocks uh, in a time of crisis. This is not, uh, this is complementary in, 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 in my view with the, 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 the DSM and, you know, the, the, the crisis management mechanism. So that's a big program, and we know that's, that's a very big, big that those are big issues, and probably we need time, we need a roadmap, we need, you know, and in order to do that, <coughs> we think this is important to go in that direction for the Eurozone in order to be more resilient. So to be concrete, let's assume Federal Reserve has misjudged the U.S. business cycle, it increased interest rates too much, we have a sudden recession in the U.S. Now, what of the things that you mentioned, the new things, how would they come into play? You have a common shock. Yeah. You think it will affect countries differentially? Uh, yes, exactly. And how would the things that you have mentioned then come into play? If you have more private risk sharing regarding banking union and capital market union, you know, it will help country during the crisis. This is the first point. So and outside the crisis also? This is less important outside the crisis, but it's important too to better finance. Your, you have two, 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 two reasons to, to have a banking union. It's to better finance companies in, in the Eurozone. That's the first one, and that's the most important in a way. And the second one is to better deal with crisis, with private risk sharing between the different countries and the different people of the Eurozone. No, actually, what I thought that you would say that, let's assume it's not a crisis, it's just a business cycle downturn. Would then the, the fiscal solidarity, the fiscal shock absorbers, the investment function, would you then put that into, into motion? Yeah, we think the, regarding the fiscal capacity, but it's different from you know, financial integration, but regarding fiscal capacity, yes, we think that it's useful in order to have stronger, uh, better convergence between the country to have an investment capacity. So, so it's a permanent investment capacity. Okay, you know. okay so let's say the US business cycle goes down. Yeah. Uh, Germany is most expo exposed to trade with the United States, so Germany suffers most, and therefore the EU will uh, finance more investment in Germany. Yeah, but, you know, the idea is that, because what really happened in, in, in the previous crisis is not really about increasing investment, but what we saw, and this is key, is a, dec a, a sharp decrease. Yeah, prevents a decline. Yeah, yeah, prevent decline. Yes, it's true, exactly. If we have a strong shock in Germany, yeah, we should prevent decline of investment in Germany. It's quite clear. Okay, thanks a lot. Thomas, you have the last word. <coughs> I don't think it's the last word for today. Um, I, I, I would have liked to be able to say um, uh, thank you to 
uh, Clemens Fuß for his introductory speech, but I missed it, so I'm sorry. So I, ca I can't say that, but I'm sure it was a good speech and uh, a good start into this conference. Um, Marco, I looked, I looked at your new book, which is always a good read, uh, of course. Um, you said that we were entering a good times. I, I was a bit surprised to hear that because what I see here is, is pretty good growth since 2014 at least. So that's four years down the road. Um, the, the, the growth you have just projected uh, has been revised upwards to 2.2% for the Eurozone. Um, I think that that's, that's absolutely in the trend and can't be you know, criticized. If I look a couple of pages further down the road, it's the potential growth. And the potential growth uh, for this year is estimated at 1.4. So I, I don't give much to the precision of this estimation. But what I want to say is that I think we are definitely in good times. We're not starting to go into good times. We are in good times. If we have four years of good growth, one needs to think about you know, when is the next turning point showing up. I don't think it would be correct to say, let's just enjoy it with starting to have good times. I mean, this may last for a while, but I'm not sure for how long it may last. So I think to reinforce your point, there's no way for complacency. There's not the moment for complacency. We have to use the good times. I mean, I'm, I'm not a real Keynesian, but I, if I was, I would say this is the time to have surpluses in the budget, to reduce budget deficits, to build up buffers uh, uh, for fiscal policies. Um, uh, but definitely we need to do something uh, to increase our growth potential. I mean, and this is maybe I, where we share uh, uh, our risk analysis or the, the, uh, our analysis as a whole um, to be not complacent. Let me go one step back. I think <coughs> um, we are in, in, in quite interesting processes. We have this uh, Tusk agenda, the leaders agenda as it's called, the EU27 process. Uh, an EU27 agenda which is also uh, taking place at the Eurogroup, uh, has been taking place at the Eurogroup on Monday. <coughs> we had for the first time this enlarged format also there preparing for this Eurozone summit in December. I think this is uh, for a good reason so, and uh, Juncker has explained it, and I think uh, President Macron has also said something about it. All, all of these 27 but one are, if you look at the treaty, future Eurozone members. So let's include them if we talk about the future. I think that's correct. Another reason to look at 27, I think, is that if we analyze what needs to be done at the Eurozone, I think we will, de we will detect that lots of the questions we are dealing with are actually single market issues. Like the banking union, I would fully agree that we have to work to complete it. We can't maybe agree today here on the podium which, which steps to take uh, uh, exactly and immediately and in which order, but uh, I think the, the fact that we need a banking union and a capital market union uh, is absolutely decisive. And, but this is mainly an EU27 uh, issue, I, I would say. So um, uh, the good times uh, are the moment to prepare for bad times. And um, uh, I said raising potential uh, of growth, uh, preparing for the digital age is also a classical uh, EU27 and single market issue and will decide on our economic strength in the future, Eurozone or not Eurozone, of course. Um, banking problems, I don't need to add uh, any more there. I think we have, if we look at the figures also in this new book, uh, we have a serious public debt problem in Europe. Full stop. Next paragraph. Uh, if you look back into the crisis, uh, you could say other regions, other countries in the world have much higher debt-to-GDP ratios than the Eurozone. True. But there was only one region in the world where investors withdrew for certain countries their, their trust, their confidence into financing these economies from one day to the other, and that was in Europe. And I think we have to take that seriously, and I think we have to one element we really have to deliver to, to re-establish once and for all this confidence into the Eurozone public finances is that we bring the high debt levels on a downward path. And I think we cannot just wait for growth and for inflation to come uh, to produce that in the end, because if we wait for that, we might wait until the next downswing. And then uh, you know, there's no, no margin of maneuver for fiscal policy. And I think this is even more important to, care, to cater for right now than to have um, uh, something on the wall for the EU for the year 2025 uh, and a fiscal and a fiscal uh, fiscal capacity or, uh, by then. I don't think 
we shouldn't talk about it, but I think there are really issues for today, for today's policies. I think if we look at Europe, it's very important to analyze properly the situation before we come up with answers, in the sense that let's not find an answer before we have defined the question or the problem. And I think there are definitely some problems which are truly European, like how to protect our borders, you know, environment, trade, uh, security, there's lots of new stuff which has come up in the last years. That's truly European, so we need to do it European. We need to find European solutions to that because these are problems with the nations, the nation states are not able to deal with, so full stop. Uh, there are other problems which point to uh, the existence of, st of structural <coughs> problems in certain member states. So if a, if a member state has always had a very high ratio of youth unemployment, there is a structural problem in that country. So the problem can only be solved in that country. And I won't say that Europe has nothing to do with that. We can give advice, we can give money, we can support it, we can coordinate policies uh, in other countries and in Europe, but we have to accept that the problem is in the country. So it has to be made clear that the problem needs to be solved there. And we can accommodate that. There's a lot to do for European policies. But if we mix these levels, we will, we will, we will fail. Because if we just throw money at a, at a country which has a, 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 a structural problem, uh, this will not help. It will help in the short term, but not in the long term. So I think that is very important. Um, uh, to, to come to an end, two, two issues briefly. Uh, convergence has been mentioned. I think convergence is an interesting issue. Uh, looking at the figures sometimes helps, as the lawyers say. If you look into the legal text, it helps you in analyzing uh, the legal solution. Um, that's also true for economists. So some, some look at the figures. If you look at convergence in the Eurozone, and you can do it as, at the same way uh, in, for the EU27, and you group the countries a little bit together, because there are, there are plenty of them, of course, um, what you can see is that there's a, an ongoing convergence process since the first day until now for the East. That is true for the Eastern countries in the Monetary Union and outside the Monetary Union. If you look at that curve, if you just group these together into one line on a, on a chart, I don't have it, so I have it here, but not there. Um, there's only one little hiccup in that curve, which is a steady rising, steadily rising curve, and that is one single year in the crisis, that's all. Uh, uh, if not, there's a whole, and, and by convergence, I mean converging to the average of the Eurozone, of course. And you might choose the indicator as you like, there are several possibilities, but it's, it's a clear picture. So convergence is ongoing. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> if you look at the, the north and the middle and the south, the picture is different. There was a very nice convergence process in the, in the first 10 years of the Eurozone. Germany coming down from 110% of the average to, towards 100. Uh, Italy coming from 105, getting closer to the average. France, I think, in between. Um, and then, th since the crisis, th the situation changed. Um, the, the, the southern bloc uh, is going below the 100% line. So there's real deconvergence, in a sense, if that exists. And for the north and the, 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 the <coughs> middle, and uh, we put France and Germany, of course, always together. So also in that graph, we put this together. Um, they, are, they are taking off and, and uh, you know, uh, and you can say dragging upwards the average, but you can also say deconverging in the other in the other direction. So also here, I think we have to analyze the situation properly. Convergence is going on in the east. That is that's a very strong and positive signal. We we never talk about it for one reason or the other. I think we should. Um, there's a real problem of convergence in the sense that people are losing track of the average, and that's in the south. And there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's some strength in the northern uh, and middle European bloc. I think that, that also might need some, some further reflection. And then resilience. I mean, we've looked at the, at, the, at the setup which we have today, because people tend to speak about an incomplete setup for the Eurozone. Um, uh, you have a number of things which uh, should strengthen uh, resilience in the, in the Eurozone and in the European Union as a whole. I think the single market, again, is there. If you talk about the shock, what, what happens if, it con if, an, if an economy is hit by a shock, the more it's integrated into an internal market, of course, the more the effects on this one economy get you know, rolled on uh, uh, to, the, to, the outer, to the outer rim uh, of that country. Of course, you, you have other markets to which you sell, you have other producers from which you buy. So this is 
flattening uh, the shock. Um, you have a banking union and capital market union just in the way as, as uh, Emmanuel described, which should help here uh, significantly if we get this thing right uh, as a shock absorber in that, in that uh, area. Um, and then we have the coordination of, of reform policies in the EU, EU semester, the European semester. Uh, we can always discuss whether this is uh, fully efficient, but the, the mechanism is clearly there. And we have, of course, coordination of fiscal policy. And if you look at this framework, which is quite discredited today, because I, I think we lost a little bit the consensus on what this is good for and whether one should apply it at all, so I think we need to uh, go into this again and rebuild the confidence into, into a, a new fiscal policy uh, framework uh, for, the, for the monetary union. But what you find in there is the target of, an, of a zero budget deficit in normal times. And this is exactly what you need to be flexible in bad times, because it means that in good times you have, an, you have a surplus. If you then enter a downswing, a downswing or a shock, um, you can just let your, your fiscal budget slow. And you don't have to worry about a deficit right then. But of course the, the, uh, the request is, and the, uh, the limitation is, you have, to, you have to reach that position of MTO, of the medium term objective of the zero uh, deficit budget, and we never do. So I, I warn a little bit about saying, okay, this is quite good in theory, but we have a problem in reaching it. Let, let, let's look for something else. I don't think for credibility reasons only, this is not the best way to do. We should first, I mean, maybe rediscuss the rules and maybe simplify them, or definitely simplify them, agree on, on how to focus them and how to implement them. Uh, but only if we create a good track record on what we have already, then we can move, or we should move ahead um, into, into new territory. So in one last sentence, because David, uh, Daniel is getting nervous, um, <laughs> um, I think there are some things where we need to apply better, and there, is some, there are some areas where we need to develop our framework and then apply it better. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Marco, you got uh, stimulated. Okay, no, thank you very much. No, I agree with uh, um, most of the things that Thomas uh, said. Uh, uh, actually, on the policy prescriptions, on the, f on the need to seize the opportunity to improve resilience, structural reforms, I mean, the focus on public debt, uh, uh, tackle the financial regime. He didn't mention it, but uh, tackled what is remaining in uh, fragilities in the banking system. I think this is uh, of utmost uh, importance. So I agree with... Uh, um, with a lot of, uh, of things. Um, let me um, come to the very first point he made on uh, good times or better times. Um, uh, it is true that we have had growth uh, uh, coming back uh, since uh, now a few years, 18, 18 quarters of, uh, of uh, positive growth for the euro area uh, as a whole, but we know where we come from. Uh? I mean, if you go back 2013, 2014, even with very conservative estimates of out of gap that we have in our uh, uh, with our production function method uh, uh, we still had the output gap of three percent we are closing the output gap uh, uh, only in 2018 in our uh, in our forecast uh, uh, here so that's why I'm saying that we we are in better times but not in full good times and if you take um, other measures of economic slack we are still not there I mean look at the you know labor market uh, who is behaving quite strongly, actually. But if you take measures of unemployment which, uh, which are beyond uh, the classic definition of unemployment, it discourages workers, uh, involuntary part-time, we are still far away from uh, uh, the pre-crisis uh, uh, period. We have... Say the opposite. Uh, you say the opposite, but it's not true. Um, <laughs> Let me just give you one indicator which goes in the opposite direction. Yeah. The labor force participation rate has increased yes. without uh, any hiccup uh, and has increased through the crisis. So all the indications are actually that our labor markets are stronger. Not all the, this overall indicator indicates that labor markets are actually stronger than before. Well, labor participation, I agree. And actually, it is, let's, not, uh, let's not be uh, get excessively depressed uh, on, uh, in the comparison with the US. I mean, we have seen the opposite uh, trend there, which is, I think is an, is an excellent thing. If you take the U6 unemployment uh, uh, definition that I'm taking, we are still about four percentage points higher now than we were before the crisis. 
so I, uh, so I think this uh, there is still an, uh, some uh, slack uh, there. You take uh, you take uh, inflation, core inflation, which is still uh, still below. So I, uh, the um, policy prescription that emerges from uh, this forecast here is that it's still not time to uh, rein back the macroeconomic, uh, let's say, accommodative, uh, accommodative policies. Let me say one final thing, and, and I think is, uh, which is important, I think, and uh, it, it's a bit against what you said, Thomas, but I think you would agree. Um, <laughs> not, be, not because I qualify certain elements. No, it is true. It is true that uh, we have had, uh, in the first 10 years of the crisis, uh, nice uh, convergence. But let's face it, it was dope. It was not a convergence which was a real real one. I mean, part ex ir irrational exuberance, part was because of the boost of EMU with the, uh, reducing, uh, uh, reducing interest right. rates. And so what you have had uh, uh, there is actually real convergence if you take GDP per capita, the classic, uh, but there was structural divergence uh, underneath. Uh, and that's what has happened, actually, it came to the fore when the crisis, uh, when the crisis hit. You look at the indicators, I mentioned it several times, I mean, of, uh, let's say, core Europe, and here I always uh, hesitate to put France, but since you put it uh, with, uh, with Germany, okay. fine, uh, in this particular case. If you look at the uh, share of tradables versus non-tradables, core Europe and the periphery, you see, actually, that the structural divergence increased during the first 10 years. So it was the period in which things okay. went more or less fine, and that's why uh, we have to be aware of uh, complacency now, because if we do a bit the same thing, we find ourselves with an, if facing the next crisis in, uh, in a position which is, I think, is even worse than we are now. I, I know narratives matter, but still our topic here is the future, right? Um, so I, I know there are some uh, <laughs> um, difference of opinion over the past, um, I want also to get the audience uh, an occasion to ask questions. Um, if you allow me, I wanted to just add one thing to what Thomas said and uh, ask perhaps a couple of you. And that's the following issue. Um, when, if the Eurozone does what you and many other people advocate, namely that every country ensures itself <coughs> by running appropriate budget surpluses and getting down that levels. The consequence is likely to be an increase in current account surplus of the euro area. Uh, and now you could say, who cares? Policy in the euro area is done only looking at the euro area itself. Or you could say that is not appropriate in a world which is anyway awash with excess savings and it keeps the interest rate uh, permanently at the zero bound. So the simple question which I have is, should we, in making setting policy and setting policy frameworks for the EU area, should we look only at our own interests, how we can stabilize ourselves, or should we look also at what contribution the EU area can make to the global equilibrium? Very brief. I know it's a very vast, right? but it, in, in the end, the answer is simple. Should we do it? Should we look mainly at ourselves and say we behave like a small country, or do we have a global responsibility? That's a big one. <laughs> yeah, well, it needs a small answer. Okay, I try uh, an entire small answer. Scaling it down, I think we have to um, first look into our own monetary union. This is what people have been talking about here from different angles. Um, uh, if we get our act together, um, that should reduce uh, imbalances within the Eurozone. And I think then um, uh, we have a better chance of arguing our, our regional case in, in, a, uh, in a worldwide context and in a worldwide economic debate. I think that is, that is the step. I think we, we, we need to take more responsibility worldwide. But I think since we are, are struggling inside what to do and how to move forward and how to strengthen our own character and whether this is to be done here or there and whether we need strong institution or not and this kind of things, we need to sort out this thing first and, and then you know, look at, at the wider context. Okay. Um, I 
was tempted to ask Massimo, because he is the one who doesn't have any institutional responsibilities, how you would react to that? Should we set our policy making and just looking at ourselves, maybe it's a small country, or do we have, as a Eurozone, a global responsibility? Well, let me also react on some of the things that the other said, otherwise, yeah, I mean, I, on this, I, th I pretty much agree with Thomas, actually, because it seems to me that we still have a number of problems that we have to solve. And one of the reasons why we have <coughs> built up a Euro, European Union, then a Euro area, because perhaps we want still to be important in the world. So at the sec at the, as a second step, you want also to consider which are your effects on the rest of the world. But uh, at the moment, I would certainly give a priority to our own problem. Can I just react to some of the things which have been said? In, uh, how much time you give me? Thank two you. minutes. Two minutes. OK, two <laughs> minutes. OK, in two minutes, I want to just to say that, uh, I mean, uh, it is very important to have this kind of meeting, because uh, clearly you can, uh, you, know, you can find things in which you agree or you disagree. So for example, if you had gone to Italy, and uh, you know, what just Thomas said before, we have, been, we have get a good time for the last four years. I mean, the, the reaction would be pretty bad, in the sense that uh, that was the average, but the result was, was uh, very different across country. And Italy has paid a particularly high cost uh, because of uh, what happened and even the things that we done. Now I think that we are entering good times. And from this point of view, you might be surprised. I perfectly agree with uh, Thomas on this point. This is the point, the moment in which we have to do more. And there is a very high legacy of debt. And so we have to do more about that. And I think that we have to strengthen and enforce the rule. I, cannot, I don't know how much I can say here, because uh, uh, I'm a member of the European Fiscal Board. Uh, we have prepared a report. This report will be public in a couple of weeks, so I cannot anticipate what is in the, the report. But certainly we made a number of proposals where I think which could strengthen the rule. Let me just say the last point about convergence, since you had mentioned your own study. I'm also going to advertise some of mine. Okay. And uh, you know, because convergence can be a complicated thing. So if, of course, if you talk about convergence, if you look only to the GDP, uh, the GDP rate or whatever, clearly there has been divergence in the crisis. Now the things are improving. And indeed, for example, if you look to Italy, if you take per capita GDP growth, it's actually been faster more recently than Germany or France or whatever. But the, the most important thing is what, which is the convergence of the public sector, the, the, the function of the public sector, because you would expect that uh, if the country became more close on some structural things, that then they might work better. Now, you had a crisis, some country had, had to adjust this crisis, you had capital flight, so of course you had the divergence and reduction of price. But if you look to the convergence on fundamental services, it seems to be that the, the convergence has increased even during the crisis, even with the adjustment. If you look at things like health, education, and uh, labor market, there seems to be more convergence, even with the southern Europe, than with respect to the other countries. There is only one point, and this is going to be very important, that's going back to what uh, we were discussing, where we, you see a lot of divergence, and uh, this is about trust in institution. And that is uh, maybe a very dangerous thing in terms of what you can actually do in terms of policy in the future. Stop. Excellent, thank you. Um, we still have 30 minutes left, so I turn to the audience to see whether there are any questions. Um, okay, usually when you have a large audience, you have a few questions, but this is different. I go one, two, and three there. Okay, why don't you go first? There should be a wandering microphone, or if you just speak very loudly, then we can understand you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Westphal and Mr. Bourdignon both mentioned the legacy debt and the debt burden. Um, but if we look at the economic figures, we can actually see that uh, debt in the EU is around 90% of GDP. Uh, debt in the US is around 110% of GDP. While um, investment in the EU has dropped around 10% since the beginning of the crisis, and the investment in the U.S. has increased around 10% or, or even more. So is it really that investors withdrew their confidence in the EU because of the debt burden? Uh, and should we really focus uh, our efforts in the future on debt reduction? Or is it really other uh, issues of structural nature in the euro area that we should be tackling? 
Uh, and my name is Alexander Alexandrov from the European Economic and Social Committee. Thank you. Thanks. No, I, 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 okay, I, I agree what you say. I, think, I don't think that there is any, I mean, different from many other people here, I don't think that there is something like an optimal level of debt, so that things work so when debt is 30%, uh, 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 things do not work when debt is 130%. What I think is that some countries, in particular in my country, my, even other countries, the periphery have to reduce the, the ratio of debt. This is not because there is uh, some kind of uh, general level things, but for two basic reasons. The first is that uh, any shift, uh, when you have debt is so high, any shift in the interest rate can put you in trouble. I mean, I mean there, there, there is enough to increase by one, we have seen, you, you might have a negative dynamic, explosive dynamic as soon as the, the, the interest goes up. And so that's the first point. The second thing is, of course, we still have the problem that we, we are not uh, the, the owner of our own currency because how the currency is determined depends on the center. I mean, so we still have, and that's what we, we had to overcome, a redenomination risk, which might be explosive in some crisis. So that's to avoid that, we definitely need to reduce uh, our debt level. So on, on that, there is no, uh, no doubt whatsoever. Okay, I'll stop here. Thomas? Yeah, very briefly. Um, yeah, I think, <coughs> From my point of view, your linkage between the debt level and the investment level is a bit too direct. Because, I mean, a deficit is not, you know, public expenditure can be at 20% of GDP, they can be at 60% of GDP. It, just, it seems to be as, you need to have an agreement in your society to finance it. I mean, that's the point. You can finance 60% of public expenditure. If you get 60% of GDP in, in, in tax receipts, then it's fine. You don't have a deficit. That's your decision. You can do it. Um, if you have a certain uh, level of public expenditure, you can spend it on consumption or you can spend it on investment. So that's the question which we call the, the quality of public finances. And actually the finance ministers in the Eurozone uh, discuss this a lot. I mean, they just had a discussion on Monday on, on, on spending on education. So I think we also need to have a debate how well is the money spent. And a deficit, as I said, is an agreement within the society to finance it or not. If there is a permanent deficit, it's just a hint for me that the society is not willing to pay what, what the state is going to spend. You know, so I think the, 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 the link between uh, should we maintain a higher debt level or even push it higher to finance investment, I don't think it's the right question. And, and, and if not, I agree very much, of course, to, to the argument of the interest rate, which fragilizes, uh, uh, make, makes a, a country fragile in, in situation of stress from one day to the other. Thanks a lot. There was a cluster of questions, one, two, three, over there. Okay, now it's many, but <laughs> you go first. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Leo hoffmann axtem I uh, work on Eurozone Governance for Transparency International and wanted to focus, the, uh, since we're talking about the future of EMU, um, the debate also a bit on the one aspect that is often underplayed in this uh, context, which is the democratic accountability and the legitimacy of uh, EMU. So one problem uh, that we have at the moment is, of course, that the southern economies, the people there, by and large, have the feeling that Eurozone uh, has not really helped them. In the north, uh, they have the feeling that they are on the hook for, for southern countries. So there's a quite broad dissatisfaction, really, in the population about these things. Uh, and to be more specific, I mean, uh, there's uh, the, the classic example of the Eurogroup as an informal body that uh, doesn't have actual decision-making authority, but does seem to take a lot of the decisions on fiscal policies and so on in an informal setting. Whereas, of course, the formal accountability mechanisms for this, that's to say the democratic control, is still at the national level. So um, the national parliaments are in charge of fiscal policy, but then there's all these informal <laughs> pressures at the, at the European level. Or another example, the fact that at the Eurogroup level there's so little agreement on reforms and on fiscal policy has meant that also the ECB is overstretched and has to pick up a lot of the things uh, that are not being done by the, by the member states, uh, thereby overstretching its mandate and, and its accountability regime. So to be more specific, one question that I would have for, for Mr. Buti, but as well for 
uh, the representatives from France and Germany would be uh, there was one extremely uh, good suggestion from my uh, point of view in the reflection paper on deepening EMU. On page 28 it suggests a legal agreement to have the Eurogroup be accountable to the European Parliament and that could be done of course also in the context of uh, a Eurogroup president who might also be part of the European Commission. So I was uh, wondering if there's uh, now in the, in the short term and also in the longer term uh, debate on, on the future of EMU, if there's uh, a lot of focus going into these uh, questions of accountability, legitimacy, and how to have concrete legal mechanisms that enable that. Thank you. Thank you. Was there another question related to this? <laughs> yeah, Bernard. Yes. If it's related? Uh, well, maybe. <laughs> I mean, it's not very related. <laughs> of course, in the end, everything has to do with everything. But I asked. Go ahead. So, two, two small points. The first one is for the two representatives from France and Germany. Sorry, I'm Blanca Sánchez Robles from Univers Universidad Nacional de Educación a Distancia in Spain. So, first point. Uh, don't you think that in, in the years after the crisis we have all um, um, become much more Keynesians and we have forgotten about structural reforms and that's precisely what we should tackle now, like removing red tape, uh, uh, improving efficiency in markets, uh, making welfare state uh, function with more efficiency, reduce uh, public, uh, the size of public sector what do you think about that? And then the other point is more perhaps uh, um, oriented towards the academics. Um, how do you think uh, we could reach an agreement in a common tax policy if we differ so much in preferences? For example, about the uh, welfare state. If a person from a Finnish, a Finnish person, a person from Finland, things uh, about this topic in a very different way from a person from Germany, I think. So in that context, how are we going to reach an agreement about uh, if about uh, if we want to, in the end, have uh, lower taxes or higher taxes? Thank you. OK, um, perhaps I start on my left. Uh, Thomas, the first question was, uh, very precise on uh, on the Eurogroup. Yeah. I, I think we need to talk about the ship. Uh, they call this ownership. It's called ownership. Uh, uh, one of the problems uh, which made this debate come up that, that you have rightly described is that um, uh, that uh, a country got into trouble that was for a good part because of bad policies in the past. So maybe of even of the current government, and then it had to ask for help. And it got the help, but together with what we call conditionality, it should be the advice and the, I mean, you know, looking at, at it from a creditor point of view, it was shielding the company, the country f from the markets for a three-year period, and advising and giving help and giving money for that country <coughs> to reform under that shield during the three years. So you might call that a, a sheer solidarity act. Of course, it was perceived differently, and. It, you described it correctly, but that is also because there hasn't been many, there hasn't been, there haven't been many governments profiting from this help, which said, "Great that we get the solidarity from our colleagues, because otherwise we'll be, we will be dead swimming in the pool, you know, belly up." Huh? And and of course we're going to do this and design this together with our friends from the other countries and the support from the Commission and all of that. This, had, this had, has very rarely happened. So there, there were lots of politicians saying back home um, that you know somebody came about them and enforced some policies which they never wanted to do. That's of course the opposite from from the ship I was talking about, the ownership. Uh, and and I think that is part of the problem. Now you can turn it around and say this leads to a democracy problem or democratic legitimacy problem. I, I think that's a bit difficult. The other side of the coin is the, the member states in the Eurozone, which have put together in over a week's time uh, billions of money in credits and, and then in the end in, in, in real capital in the ESM institution, they have to justify themselves in their national parliament. None of these guys can go home and say, look, we're going to pay in 10 billion next month 
uh, into a newly created fund in, in Europe, and I was uh, talking to this um, uh, to the European Parliament after having been to the Eurogroup, and they doubled the sum. But this is the democratic legitimacy they have, and now we need to pay it. This wouldn't work because we have a national democra democratic system in which all of these ministers have to justify themselves. And I can tell you, when I spend you know a, a good part of my of my job time. In, in, the, in the Bundestag, in our parliament, exactly justifying, pre-justifying what we will do in the Eurogroup, justifying after the meeting what we have done in the Eurogroup. So there, I, I feel that there's plenty of democratic legitimacy. Um, I, I see that you know, in the future state of Europe, you know, if you know, there was a discussion about real European money, which we had contributed to Europe over years, and now we need to decide on the spending, here you have a legitimacy point uh, to, to link that to the parliament, uh, but I think that that is already basically done. Um, structural reforms bridge the difficulties, or you, you want me to stop? Very briefly. If I thought perhaps structural reforms no, no, were your first priority. No, no, anyway, okay. um, I wanted to have you address the same question of democratic accountability, because Thomas mentioned um, ownership, national ownership. Is it wrong to say that there's a very good correlation between national ownership and the success of the programs and, and their cost. Okay, uh, there are two different issues. Uh, I agree with that with fully, but what was uh, uh, Thomas was mentioning, it was national ownership on the part of the creditors. Uh, also, uh, uh, now, okay, it is, uh, no, uh, okay, to take your point, no, absolutely true that uh, uh, national ownership uh, is, has been a key element in the success of the programs. I mean, okay, here we are talking about, uh, um, when we think about uh, ESM, EFSF programs, uh, or even before the balance of payments uh, and the, for the first uh, shock with uh, um, countries outside the euro area, what is fresh in the memory is Greece, let's face it. You know, we always think about that. Uh, but I think we have to put things in perspective. And if you take the first wave of programs and you take then also the Euro area uh, member states, I mean, we have, uh, uh, we have had, uh, I would say here, a stunning success looking at, the, uh, at the, what the situation is now. You look at the forecast uh, today, you take uh, not only Ireland, special situation, I mean, with a lot of uh, structural, uh, you know, favorable structural features. And you take also, I mean, Spain was affected by the shock, no full program, but on financial. Portugal also now, uh, as well, you know, Cyprus, uh, and growth ev eventually coming back on Greece uh, uh, as well. And it is clear that the degree of ownership on the pro of the programs with difficult beginnings, because, I mean, uh, if it, it was... No, no, La no. I, I mentioned the euro area. I think in Latvia, clearly, the first uh, in the first uh, uh, wave. I think the uh, the success now on the uh, let's say exploiting the better economic climate, uh, better growth uh, inside the uh, Europe and outside, is also very much related to the reforms made during the hard times of the uh, uh, of the program. This is as far as the ownership of the countries, uh, which. Uh, uh, had to apply for uh, EU IMF uh, uh, assistance. Now then there is the issue of uh, ownership and the democratic uh, let's say accountability, ownership of the camp of the creditors. Now, uh, I think what we did uh, uh, during the crisis was to fix the plane while we were fly, uh, flying, also from the point of view of <coughs> building institutions. So we started with you know, pooling the funds uh, for Greece, then the EFSF, uh, EFSM, and then eventually the, the, uh, uh, the ESM. But it is true that uh, thinking about the, um, let's say, the steady state input legitimacy is as important as output uh, uh, legitimacy. And from that viewpoint, uh, I think the perception that uh, you have bodies which are not fully legitimized. Uh, they have the, certainly the legitimacy at the national level. Each parliament uh, clearly has, the, has that you know, empowerment, uh, uh, certainly. But collectively, there is no uh, you know, uh, 
complete accountability, and also from the point of view of the debtor, so the receiving uh, countries, um, the fact that you have uh, you do not have uh, full uh, democratic legitimacy, I think, is an issue. Huh? So from looking forward, thinking about the uh, the steady state and the final equilibrium, I think having uh, decision making and bodies which are more in line with the classic community method, I think is uh, would be a big uh, a big plus and an important an important development. I mean, uh, what we are going to uh, do in uh, December when we come forward with the package uh, on EMU, we are going to have a proposal. Uh, I know it's not going to fly uh, very easily, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's important to have to communitarize the, uh, the ESM, so to move from uh, a, um, to move from uh, uh, no, to incline. Okay. Um, no, this, the uh, slope is important. Um, so gradient. No, to communitarize the, the ESM and, uh, and to make this uh, uh, EU, EU body, obviously in a very prudent uh, way, you'll see the proposal when it, uh, when it comes up. And I think for the Eurogroup also there has been a debate uh, uh, on uh, the degree of transparency of this. I think the, the transparency of the Eurogroup has increased in the past, but there's still a way to go. So having uh, a certain element of uh, ac better accountability vis-a-vis -vis European bodies, in particular the European Parliament, I think is important. Page 28, uh, I think you have read the reflection paper very well. Uh, I think that's what we put forward uh, there. See, even page 28 was re read. Uh, Massimo, a comment on uh, corporate tax harmonization and different national preferences. Yes, oh. but I arrived there. I mean, I cannot resist the body stinks of democracy, but I'm getting there. I'm not wasting time. I mean, I'm, honestly, we have to look at this, the situation, how it's now, and how we are going. I think that all this, I don't think that, okay, I think that there is enough democratic legitimacy as it is in Europe, uh, so it's not such a big issue if you look at the things, but there are, uh, but if we really want to solve this problem, at the end, uh, where we have to go? We have to go in a situation, I, I want to be very blunt here, we don't have to invent anything new. We have to come in a situation which is a separation between the federal government and the national government. The federal government, which means uh, the European Parliament, the European, uh, the Council of, uh, of the, 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 the Council of the European uh, or uh, Euro members have something to say and they have their tax base, they are making their decision and they are accountable to citizens and whatever. So at the end, the where we have to go it has to be this kind of clear division of responsibility. Otherwise we keep going all this kind of uh, mixed uh, accountability which m create problems. I think at, uh, at a certain point we will have to uh, uh, converge there because I don't think so otherwise we will never be able to solve completely this confusion. Concerning corporate taxation, okay, let me say just two things. First, uh, at the moment, we don't even know what, uh, what we call profits around the in, in Europe is different in each country. We, we don't define them in the same way. So at the very least, let's start to have the same definition. This is the, uh, the idea of a consolidated corporate income tax base, which I've been discussing for years and still there. Second, once you have done that, it does not mean that you have to impose the same tax everybody, but everywhere. But uh, th then uh, you, can, uh, you, you can appropriate uh, the tax base in a more sensible uh, way, avoiding tax avoidance, tax shifting, whatever. That would be the second thing. Third, I think that there is a problem. I mean, uh, there is a, problem, a moment in which we want to ask uh, if uh, we can really allow country inside, uh, whether you have perfect capital mobility, perfect uh, corporate mobility, you can allow country to set up the tax as they like. I know that the treaty at the moment is like that. But I think this is a problem we should uh, start rising again. Because we do have a problem tax competition in Europe. And a long time ago, I mean, because we, I mean, we are always there, I mean, with the Rudy report, one of the proposals was exactly the introduction of a minimum corporate tax rate. So you could not go below the minimum corporate tax rate. And there are also some kind of theoretical argument to suggest that this is actually better than cooperation or having just the same tax rate. I'll stop it. The same tax rate. Thanks a lot. Finally, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, remain in Central Bank, Daniel there. And I'd like to ask you something. What's been striking from this panel debate, too, and it's, it's not a 
something which is not known, is that there is a clear discrepancy of views on what it takes for the euro area to become more robust, clearly. I mean, it's, I listen to, I've been listening to Mr. Westphal, it's the line of reasoning, then Monsieur Massé. Well, I'll ask you, and Mr. Westphal has said, look, we've been in a recovery period for four years now. So it's strange to say that we are entering uh, a period of good times. Okay, Mario Butti has explained why we think, because we, we're just closing now the output gap. But I'm asking you, for years the ECB has been practicing unconventional policies. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a combination of cyclical recovery which has been underpinned by unconventional policies. The moment you start to normalize policies, pr uh, assuming that it can be done, and I have big doubts we can normalize policies, but assuming that we do normalize policy, wh what do you think is going to happen? I mean, we do have structure, con continuous structure divergence inside the euro area. So what's going to happen? Do we have the buffers in the euro area to stop capital fleeing the weaker, the more fragile member states. I, and I think this is the big issue. Because if capital starts to flee, again, Italy, Portugal, Spain, I mean, we should ask ourselves what's going to happen. And a, a new uh, episode of recession will happen. I mean, it's, th this is a market economy. It's inevitable to happen again. So do we have the buffers? And, and my question is, do we have, what is the critical mass of buffers the euro area needs so that we should fend off i mean it's a new hit and i think here we have a clash of conceptual i mean uh, uh, views a clear clash of views you said i ask you no i'm asking both On i mean it's uh, if we don't have the grand bargain in this res respect then we should worry about the future Yes, uh, thank, you, thank you for, for, for this question. I think, I don't know what, what, what we need exactly. It's very difficult to say well, what we fix the euro <coughs> and be sure that whatever the crisis, you know, it will be sufficient. But what I'm sure is that we have to go in the right direction. And that's what I try to, to explain. We have to do more resp regarding responsibility and we have to do more regarding risk sharing and solidarity in the eurozone. But I cannot say what is necessary to have much lower level of debt or at the same time, you know, private restraining. I think it's very important to work on that and to see if we think that what is important is private restraining, public restraining, lower level of debt. That, that's, those are the questions in order to, to answer you, you, your question. But I'm not able to, to say to you exactly what are, you know, the right levels in order to be sure that whatever happens, you know, we are, we are ready, but I'm sure we, sh we have to go in the right direction in order to, to, to make the Eurozone more resilient. I, I'm not absolutely sure. I, I, I really, I really got your, your your point, but I, I will try to to answer what I what I understood. Um, I agree. We are living on uh, on the back a little bit uh, of unconventional monetary policy. I thought we had constructed a eurozone on the basis of monetary policy only caring about inflation. Now, even people here on the podium have talked several times about this being the only show in maintaining demand, which is clearly was not the initial idea, but maybe okay. Uh, so we are living in unconventional support times from the monetary policy side. And we have not been able on the fiscal side to normalize the situation in the sense that since we are in after four years here in, in, in a growth period um, to, to have a surplus in the budget. There's one country which is the one I'm coming from which has a surplus and which is criticized for having a surplus in good times. Okay, um, I think if we go on living on support from well, at least a little bit supportive fiscal policy and 150% supportive monetary policy, if we wait for the next downswing to come, we will be in big trouble. So we need to use this good time, this is what I've been saying, and I think 
if you ask if you ask a German this question, the answer will come back straight. This is have a, a, a solid, credible policy and a solid, credible economic development, and then you can convince markets to stay in once the times get rough. And of course, if you have your your, your, your public finances in order, you can offer public spending uh, if, if times get rough. If the monetary policy has normalized by then, they could offer a reduction of interest rates and the normal, the normal things you guys do in this situation. If you are uh, continuously at 0% interest rates, your pocket is empty when it comes to the next crisis. And if, if the debt levels stay where they are today, uh, the fiscal policy pocket is also empty. So this is why I worry about the next downswing. And I think we could have a perfectly economic discussion on whether there's still slack, whether they, how much the, the, uh, the output gap is closed or for how long it has been closed or whatever. Um, I just wonder how long the growth process can be maintained. I mean, just imagine in two years' time the growth is going down, and we say, no, no, you can't go down because we only closed the output gaps two years ago. Growth wouldn't reply positively, you know. That's the, you know, how long can this last? And I'm not so sure, but we only have so much time, and I can't tell you how much time we have, but I think we need to use the good time to prepare. Let me just say, in defense of the question, I thought it, I understood as the following. The fact that we now have relatively good times. It's only because we have the ECB doing all this heavy lifting. And if the ECB were to stop, we would fall into a situation where we would get recession and uh, capital would flow widely from one country to the next. Let me say I fundamentally disagree with that diagnosis because, uh, let's take the case of Germany, um, if you have a current account surplus of 8% of GDP, although it has mysteriously dropped to seven in your latest forecast. Um, that means about every third euro saved must be invested abroad. And where can it go but elsewhere in the, in the eurozone? So in that sense, I'm pretty relaxed about the ECB <coughs> stopping its conventional monetary policies. But I thought the premise was, if the ECB stops, all hell will break loose. And what do we do then? But you had another comment. Yes, just, just You. What is key? What is key is about regarding the ECB is the level and, and the level of in inflation. It's not working with me. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> yeah, it must be B. I don't know why. <laughs> and regarding inflation, we have to relate this question with with the Phillips curve and what is happening in in Europe regarding wages in the different countries. And I think this is an important issue to look at, you know. Because if we want to rebalance the Eurozone, you know, regarding competitiveness, we have to look at wages in different countries. And at the end of the day, what is inflation? It's, it's broadly the aggregation of the wages growth in the different countries. So I, I, I agree with the fact that if we had higher inflation, it will help Everybody, and I'm not talking about, you know, 3% inflation. I'm just talking about going to 2%. Well, very, well, no, very quickly on this. Um, our assessment uh, based on this is that uh, it is uh, still too early to withdraw policy support on both sides, uh, monetary and fiscal. Um, I would like to... <laughs> put uh, things a bit in perspective with just a couple of figures. Uh, because, I mean, we tend here also to, not here in particular, but in general, I mean, to indulge in bashing our uh, system of surveillance, uh, the stability pact doesn't work. Uh, uh, um, it is true that the trust in the system has uh, gone uh, down. Um, but one has to look a bit the results. I mean, e euro area deficit, 1% just above 1%, 2017. Um, US, 5%. Um, Japan, Japan, over 4%. Growth in the past five years, average, 2.5 US, 1.5 the uh, Eurozone. So, I mean, in conditions which have been, uh, you know, pretty tough uh, indeed, I think having brought down the deficit uh, 
to this end, it is so expected to continue to come down in the next uh, in the next two years. Does not seem to be a performance that is, uh, un, uh, you know, showing irresponsible policies. True, sometimes uh, uh, the SGP has been implemented in ways uh, which are, let's say, different than uh, the original uh, script. But in terms of delivery, I think one cannot uh, uh, one cannot uh, let's say rubbish what has been done and. You can say, okay, it is the euro area average, but even if you look at performance across mm -hmm. member states, you look at the exit from uh, from EDP from 24 countries, uh, uh, and we are left to two, uh, and they are going to go out if everything goes uh, well. I mean, next uh, next year, I think certainly QE has helped and more monetary Sorry, policy. Can I just make the question more precise? You said policy stimulus should not be withdrawn totally now. Your forecast of relatively good growth rates in the future, are they based on continuing policy stimulus or on a reduction in the policy stimulus? No. Okay, we have uh, um, a, um, a forecast which is based on so-called unchanged policies. It is that our- QE policies. forever. Hmm? QE forever. No, 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 it is, uh, it is uh, we have taken uh, the reduction in, in QE and then we, con we let's say, project in the future not to go into excessive details on that front uh, there. <laughs> so let me let me be let me be let me be uh, slightly uh, ambiguous uh, on this profiting from uh, profiting from the ambiguity on this. Uh. On uh, it is very clear on what we do on the fiscal side, which is no policy change. We means basically a, uh, the structural balance remains okay. broadly unchanged. Thanks. There were two people over there who have been extremely patient. Um, one, and I think somewhere in the vicinity, if you could both ask your question. On the right hand side there. Yeah, my name is Jürgen Mattes. I'm from the Cologne Institute for Economic Research, and I would like to come back to one of the issues that has been raised um, during the discussion pretty early on the question of uh, what is the role of the EU in helping um, the risks. So we were talking about the maturity extension as a uh, country you would enter to an ESM program. Um, on the face of it, this might um, raise risk potentials, but on the other hand, we have built the ESM in order to um, just avoid what has been um, put into the window as a scare scenario that um, highly countries um, in the end face increased risk premiums and enter into a spiral that ends uh, with default, basically. for larger EMU, EMU countries. And so the maturity extension would be a measure to make the ESM credible. And this is a big issue in order to, well, reduce risk in the system. And <coughs> when you look in the, uh, at the face of it, a maturity extension on the condition of interest rates or interest being continuously paid is a very minor reduction in the present value of the debts. So obviously the financial markets could tatter a bit, but in the end it's overall a re reduction in the risk system. Okay, there was somebody in your vicinity who had a question, yes. Um, hi we are really very brief now, we are ready yeah, at... Uh, very brief. Uh, to Thomas Westphal, uh, you said one of the major future challenges is You said also perhaps they are not implemented uh, to full efficiency. My question is, the old is saying, says, says um, rules are only as good as uh, rule following, and rule following is only as good as rule enforcement. So given these mechanisms in place, uh, according to your own wording, uh, what efficiency do you think has the rule enforcement it's mechanisms? Okay, and finally, I had two people who also have been very patient here. Uh, one, you, and... <coughs> okay, super quick, yeah. And now people have to go. So, very quick, we have to have a last <coughs> one. Joost <coughs> van Eersel of the uh, European Economic and Social Committee. Question to Mr. Massé and Mr. Westphal. Mr. Westphal makes a clear distinction between things that have necessarily to be done at European level and he says, for the rest, it is a responsibility of the member states 
uh, we cannot intervene in their labor market uh, mechanisms, for instance, when they don't work, uh, clear, clear, clean your own garden. Mr. Massey says, on the other hand, we have a long list of things that have to be uh, Europeanized, including elements th that Mr. Westphal considers to be purely national, I suppose, is there. Uh, how do you see the discrepancy between Mr. Westphal's view on what has to be uh, organized at national level in order to bring uh, the train further on track, and your own view that uh, a number of policies have to be introduced, notwithstanding, what, uh, despite what has certainly to be done at national level, uh, in order to get the train driven in the right, conducted in the, in the right way. Thanks a lot. That fits perfectly with my plan to end the session. Uh, I start on my left um, and then end up uh, with Massimo. Very briefly, since everybody <coughs> thinks he has to run. Yes, okay, sure. Um, rule enforcement. Uh, I, I think I, I mentioned that I see a, a vanishing or a vanished consensus on the fiscal rules. So we have a fiscal set of rules which I would call one of the pillars of our EMU. It's a rules-based system, but today you would find maybe 19 different point of views, or 20 if you, if you put the commission in that, uh, on, on what that means and how it should be applied. So I think we have to absolutely re-establish the solidity of this column, because otherwise um, this is not very solid. But I agree, of course, with you, and I, I think that's, that's in, inclined in what I said, uh, you cannot insist on rules which everybody reads in a different way and, and nobody applies anyway, or I'm, I'm exaggerating. Um, so you have to, we have to work on that, and I think this needs to be on the agenda, and it will be. I mean, the Eurozone ministers have discussed that, and if you listen to what Dijsselbloem said after the Eurogroup on Monday, he said this is one of the fiscal issues which is on the table. We need to re-establish a, a consensus on these rules, and it could be different rules, or re, you know, the rule set is, is quite expensive today, so uh, extensive, not expensive, extensive. Um, uh, so we need to work on this to come to a set of rules where we have a consensus and then it can be applied, it should be applied, and we need to think about how to uh, apply it. I would favor, a, I would have a tendency to favor a, a, a technical analysis of the application of the rules, which is public, and then a political decision taking taken on how to, what to draw as a political conclusion from that. So we perfectly keep the political uh, approach from the Commission, but we need, in addition to that, a technical approach which gives you the fact in the first place. We have that in Germany, our Kartellamt, which is the competition authority, can say a merger is against the rules, can't be done, and it's fully transparent, it's published, and then the economic minister, by law, has a possibility to overrule that. But he has to do that in public, and it's perfectly legitimate transparent, political, whatever. So I think this is the way forward here. Um, I, I think, I mean, in your, I mean, the two of us, we work together on a weekly basis, monthly basis. We meet in Berlin, in Paris, uh, 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 and, we, and we discuss all these issues in very much detail. And <laughs> I wouldn't, <coughs> sorry, I wouldn't overestimate the distances. I wouldn't. I, I think that Emmanuel uh, would agree that there's lots of things to do. And if you look at what France does with the new, under the new government, it's precisely this. They're tackling uh, reform issues in France. And this is giving, a, I'm following Macron's argument here fully, this is giving credibility for European arguments. If you don't do anything at home and you only claim European solutions, not really credible, I would suppose. So I think that there is a good bridge and, and we're, we're working towards each other. I have to make a disclaimer on, on, you know, I can't offer any political way today because back home we don't have a government. I mean, we always have a government, but it's a caretaker government. Uh, you know, I don't know, but uh, I think everybody can count on a future uh, way of compromise um, on a number of things in, in this area between France and Germany, taking things forward. Yes, yes. Uh, 
fully share what Thomas says about your, your question. So, so if we have to work on it and work together, and we are doing it on, on a regular basis. Regarding the question of automatic maturity extension, because I think it's a key question, for me, it's not a measure of risk reduction, clearly not, when we are talking about, you know, banks, and it's a matter of risk reduction, but here it's not a matter of risk reduction, it's a, a shift of risk from the SM to the market, and we are very worried about the reaction of the market regarding such automatic, you know, restructuration or automatic maturity extension or anything related to an automatic way to 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 have a, to, to an automatic you know uh, mechanism which which decrease the value of the obligation in the market so that's why we we are very very re reluctant about such such measures thanks a lot marco okay no. very briefly um i think on the on the question i, I express myself uh, uh, before, no, I think uh, that is not a good idea. Uh, we have CACs, uh, uh, we have provision in the ESM uh, uh, treaty that allows uh, to consider private sector involvement when needed. I think we should not invent anything else, not going beyond the, the, the uh, IMF uh, doctrine. Uh, we don't want to trigger credit events uh, uh, which would uh, uh, either bring forward uh, the market instability in the first place uh, when whenever there is a s uh, there is a uh, let's say expectations of uh, possible uh, uh, um, application to have uh, to to have a help uh, help or uh, maybe even worse uh, delayed uh, delay the uh, the countries coming forward for uh, uh, for help because they fear the credit event and uh, debt reprofiling which is uh, basically debt restructuring also so I don't think that's the way uh, to go. There, is, there are other ways uh, we can discuss in another occasion to increase market discipline, not, uh, uh, not that one. Uh, I think the final point I would like to make maybe is uh, going back to what uh, uh, Daniel asked in the first place on uh, self-insurance uh, versus uh, some euro area instruments. I think self-insurance is important, uh, but uh, put your house in order, which is the, what is behind the self-insurance, is uh, uh, necessary but not sufficient. So I think creating the room for maneuver to respond, yes, but what we have seen uh, in, in the experience of the past uh, f uh, few years is glaring, uh, and I think uh, um, um, it was mentioned by, uh, by Massimo at the beginning, uh, you cannot force creditor to do things against the will. Uh. So, and I think that increases uh, the uh, political controversies and tensions within the Eurozone. So I think having something which has strong re, uh, rebuilding the buffers and having <coughs> self-insurance coupled with for large shocks with the possibility to intervene at the Euro area level with a fiscal capacity providing stabilization, I think is something which would help a lot reduce the tensions and the political uh, um, controversy within the, within the eurozone and also help to implement the rules, putting more emphasis on on uh, sustainability rather than stabilization. Massimo, okay. Um, on the on the question about the automatic restructuring of public debt, which is the, the proposal about the ESM to uh, increase or enlarge market discipline. Uh, I'm not a very much a believer in market discipline because I mean what we have seen a lot of time is that market tend to be smooth for a long time and then react to suddenly. So, I mean, we know there are a lot of problems in financial market will lead to self-fulfilling equilibrium, multiple equilibria. So you might, you might create a lot of instability. You might also end up by uh, creating, uh, making a country which maybe has a liquidity crisis in being insolvent. So we have to be very careful with uh, what you do when you, when you send signal to the financial market. What I'm very much afraid is so, so sold uh, um, another kind of uh, the wheel effect. You, know, you walk on a beach, uh, then you go there, you say, at the, you know, at the end of the walk on the beach, you say, from tomorrow, we are, oh, by the way, from tomorrow we are going to have a private sector involvement all the time that we save a bank and you have the euro crisis. So you have to be very careful. What I believe instead is uh, on external force. So I think we have to increase more the uh, we, we have to make this uh, this uh, rule more uh, more um, uh, how do you say um, more able to uh, to deliver what has done in the past. Uh, even if uh, I more or less uh, broadly share what we were saying, Marco Butti, before about the result of uh, this fiscal surveillance, 
let me remind you that when we talk about the relation, uh, when, we, when we talk about reducing debt level, we are talking about reducing debt over GDP. And uh, clearly, when the GDP goes down, nominal GDP has happened in, in a number of cases, it's very difficult to, to, to reach this result. And uh, I mean, I would, I would like just, to, just a word of, of uh, caution. I mean, the auto gap as we measure, you know, it, 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 was, uh, it has the common methodology, something which uh, there are a lot of hysteresis going there. Uh, so I mean, you, you, the risk is that if the country goes down, then you assume that the auto gap is reducing while it's not because there are hysteresis. So we have to be careful. Uh, I think uh, now situation is improving, so I think that is the moment in which we have to make more step uh, in, uh, in uh, increasing, enforcing the rule. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Massimo. Um, with only a few minutes uh, delay, we can now start into the coffee break. Uh, we'll soon have the keynote speech by the governor of the Banque de France, so please be back on time. And Clemens, would you like to add anything? Okay, thanks a lot. Bye -bye.